move to our um, next presenter, um, Ben Whitbone um, from Deakin University. Uh, Deb, he, um, Deb Roscoe is going to share his presentation. Um, ben is, um, Dr. Ben is a senior lecturer in inclusive education and the director of Master of, of Special Inclusive Education at Deakin University. Um, hopefully I said that wrong. I've, right, I've got the um, little thing over the thing. <laughs> um, Dr. Whitburn seeks to heighten equity across the educational sector by building the ca capacity of educators to address breaches between theory and practice. And um, I often tell Ben that I sleep with him each night. It's terrifying. I do have his book by my bed, every, which I'm working my way through his latest book, Disability and the University, a Disabled Students Manifesto, which I recommend to all of you. Okay, so I'll hand over to you, Ben. Welcome. I'm looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Darlene. That's quite the uh, introduction. Did, can you hear me okay? I can. It's you wonderful. Can. Great. And and perhaps you're you can see me fine. as well. Yep, we can. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation from where I am presenting. They are the traditional owners of what is now known as the Me uh, Melbourne, Melbourne region. Um, and in recognition that, um, of course, we are dispersed across the many countries that comprise what is Australia today, I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging uh, from across these varied lands. Now, I will uh, let you all know that uh, I am unavoidably uh, vision impaired. Uh, I'm using a screen reader and a Focus 40 Braille display connected to an iPhone uh, to, to, to do the presentation. Uh, luckily, there's Deb and Darlene running the PowerPoints and the buttons and um, moderating any uh, comments, challenges or questions that appear in the chat. And to that end, and actually importantly to my presentation today, the support I am drawing on is indispensable to it going ahead, both technologically and personally. And hopefully uh, <clears throat> my meaning will come out as uh, I present further. Uh, I'll do my best also to describe what appears on the screen, which is largely text-based, um, but I integrate it into my presentation as I go along. Today, what I want to draw your attention to is what we might call points of departure or the ways that we orientate our thinking towards inclusion in higher education and in addition, disability. Deb, can I get you to go to the next slide for me? Uh, now, how good is everybody's Latin here? Nihil de nobis sine nobis. Nothing about us without us. Now, that is, this is a phrase that we've heard quite a lot of across the, the three days of the, the conference so far. And um, uh, it's one that I wish to, to consider a little further. Um, in particular, it came from uh, 16th century Poland, where people were, were, were trying to, uh, where, where they were handing over uh, from a monarchy to a republic. Uh, it's made its way into disability scholarship by way of a fellow named James Charlton, who wrote a book in 1998, where he interviewed a lot of um, advocates of disability from across the world. And what they, what he found in his research was raised conscious for people was, was with disabilities was um, the objective of these um, of these advocates, both politically and personally with, with everyday facets of their lives. lives. And what Charlton's research really found was what um, raising consciousness really meant was to, uh, it, well, the, the concept of revo rev uh, revolved around group organization. Without conscious interest in everyday life, he writes, social change is subject to whimsy and chance. Now, raising consciousness for them shifted disability from a medical deficiency to a social one. And if we might take, uh, if we might understand this as two ends of a spectrum, to some extent, we have swapped uh, medical for social. And this resonates with lots of the things that go on today. Now, there's an inevitable lament that comes to educators, practitioners, students and their families as to how inclusive education policy is consistent, consi consistently fails to make its mark on practice and, and leaves those so desperately, so desperate for its fulfillment 
in its wake. Now, my contention today is that some of the ideas and the tools that we have been using may have been misappropriated and appropriated and outdated. And new theories that build on these in the discipline of what we call disability studies in education can help us to maintain relevancy. That is to say, inclusion, is, inclusion edu in education is really little more than a theory. And until it is enacted, that is until it is enacted in a situated practice. And at this stage, I think many might agree that inclusive education tends to be understood in terms that are remedial, compensatory, and perhaps even mitigative of barriers and difference. So they're the sorts of things I want to discuss today. Uh, today. On to the next slide. Thanks, Dev. And there'll be two interconnected uh, provocations that I want to make in this presentation. And um, firstly, I'm borrowing from the, I, I, the writing of Dan Goodley, how um, our discussions may well start with disability, uh, but it will not end there um, as we consider broader transformative possibilities. And also some work that I've been doing with some colleagues at Deakin about inclusion in higher education, inclusion in education more generally, are conceptually and temporally mediated. That is to say the concepts that we use lead us to a point and perhaps they've reached their utility. Um, so we'll draw together some of these provocations and expand on their relevance for educators and practitioners by emphasizing conceptual relationality in engaging in teaching and learning. Let's start with a bit of history. Uh, Deb, next slide, please. Uh, what you can see on the screen here, hopefully, is a picture of Ed Roberts, and he was the first man with a disability who used a wheelchair to attend the University of California, Berkeley in the 1960s in the United States. Now, he had contracted polio at a young age and he uh, slept in an iron lung. Um, and forgive me for using these words, but it's a quote that uh, Ed, Ed Roberts has actually um, uh, recalled himself, the university telling him when he tried to enroll, we tried cripples and they don't work. Now we might question uh, what was meant by the term cripple and we might question what was termed by uh, the term work. Um, but he successfully uh, litigated, litigated against the university and he managed to get entrance um, to study the, the course of his choosing. Now, uh, this, there are points here that resonate with today. The support that he received was at time ad hoc, funding, precarious, and staff often did not understand their roles and responsibilities to provide Robert's access to learning. Next slide. Thanks, Deb. Now, while this was going on, um, Roberts was joined by other students because given that he slept in an iron lung, he was accommodated in what uh, was the on-campus hospital. Uh, however, in that way, he, um, he lobbied for, for others to join him for that to become a uh, dormitory. And the, he was joined by six or seven other people with disabilities. Now, they claim, of course, that they were segregated by living in a hospital on campus, but amongst them, they were included socially, intellectually, and um, it, it led them to some interesting outcomes. Next slide. Thank you, Deb. Uh, that is to say the group would go on to start an activist collective called the Rolling Quads. Uh, and this was a coalition of disabled students determined to increase accessibility across campus, build a residence outside of the hospital grounds and secure financial assistance for personal care attendants. And uh, they successfully did that. And the group evolved into an effective political force, a disability rights group that lobbied uh, more broadly for the creation of student support model uh, and the student uh, disability program, which actually is the precursor for the likes of many of the disabled disability resource centers that we have in universities today which is um, an interesting bit of history. Next slide, thanks, Deb. Now, of course, across the Atlantic Ocean at the time, similar pol political actions were taking place. The Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, 
or UPIAS, was an organisation formed exclusively of people with disabilities, and they published themselves a manifesto that in 1976 entitled The Fundamental uh, Principles of Disability. Big words. Uh, similarly to the rolling quads, the principal cause of exclusion for people with disabilities, according to them, was not their impairments as such, but the barriers that prevented them from participating uh, in everyday life on par with their able-bodied peers. Uh, this manifesto would go on to serve as the point of departure for what Mike Oliver later coined the social model of disability, which of course is a very popular or well-known cultural artifact of, of disability scholarship and um, activism that has had international appeal. Now, like, like Ed Roberts and the Rolling Quads, uh, that this, this, this drew out to, to the broader services agenda um, away from education to include transport, labour market conditions and so forth. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Deb. Bringing things a bit closer to home and to the present day. The notion of inclusive education today is frequently presented within a rights-based argument. That is to say that people with disabilities are the rights holders and part of this framework is that as rights holders um, that they have the, the right to enroll and participate in, in learning. And it's our responsibility to make that happen. Uh, there's a really interesting quote here from Lucy Series, it's something that she published, published last year, however, that um, refers to this uh, rights-based discourse through the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. And she writes, the benchmark against which successful implementation of the CRPD will be measured is the extent to which disabled people really do enjoy equal rights in comparison with others in their society. And I will return to this rights situation in a couple of slides down the track. Uh, next one, thanks, Deb. Now, I'm kind of, Returning to my second provocation here, and I've gone back to the Bradley report from 2008 and gone through it a bit like a, um, a discourse analysis to, to, to make sense of how uh, in this document, inclusive education is understood, inclusion for people with disabilities is understood in, 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 a, in a fairly landmark report from 2008. And it's, I think these are interesting terms and I'll go through the list for you. There's widening participation, equity, access and participation of underrepresented groups of students um, and social inclusion. Um, now, what is interesting here is um, again, like I say, temporal, temporal bounded ideas about what inclusive education is, I think we could probably all argue that it goes a bit beyond uh, legal enrollment and widening participation today. Um, and that we might, we, we really would like to be um, lobbying for, for involvement of people with disabilities in some of the other aspects that are important to universities today, such as what is knowledge and whose knowledge counts. Um, impact in research, inclusion in the employability agenda. And I think these are really important points that um, uh, it's incumbent on all of us to, to consider in our, in our roles. Um, next slide. Thank you, um, Deb. I'm ripping through these quite quickly. Um, so I've recently um, taken quite an interest in time or more specifically, how as educators and educational support, we utilize time in ways that can either promote or hinder inclusive education. Now, there's been a lot of casual references made to time in this conference that I've found fascinating. Um, and yesterday and the day before, a lot about being time poor, about educators understanding that um, to make something accessible or inclusive may take more time. Uh, Meryn's presentation this afternoon was really interesting about students who uh, could gain a lot by getting a lot or by getting some extra time for their examinations. And these are really common, reasonable adjustments that are made here. Now, courses of study in higher education are often sub subject to strict temporal conditions. 
uh, students are expected to apply themselves to preset blocks of learning um, time through semesters, assessment periods, um, showing pr progress against year level curricula. Um, and, and these are preconceived programs of duration. Now, students are therefore, if we uh, are able to get through without disclosing a disability or a need for a reasonable adjustment, students are therefore included on the basis that they can comply with a normative way of doing things within the timeframes that have been set. Now at our university, there's 11 weeks for a trimester, uh, probably about 10 weeks of teaching, uh, maybe two hours of that per week. Uh, it doesn't leave you a lot of time to engage with things and perhaps you need more time. Much of the literature about the experiences of student exclusion actually speak um, to the contrary of the capacity to comply with uh, this time and and that there's often discussions made about insufficient time or the inability to adapt to restrictions of time. Uh, teachers often argue as well that they haven't got time, as I said earlier, to, to, to make uh, adjustments for students. Uh, really interesting area to be, to be putting research into, but um, I guess disclosure and individualized planning provides a way that temporal standards can be challenged. However, Disclosure is not always something that people want to do, nor are plans implemented consistently. So here's where uh, I finally get to what is on the slide. And that is a concept of crip time, which you might be familiar with. Now, crip time is really uh, drawing on uh, crip theory. That is to say uh, our disabilities are there and we may take uh, differential ways of uh, time and ways to access our work. And there's a great quote from Ellen Samuels on the screen. And Ellen Samuels is a, um, uh, a, 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 an academic, a, a disability scholar from the United States who lives with a um, uh, condition that means that she has variations in time and capacity to participate in day-to-day -day life. And she writes, we who occupy the bodies of crypt time know that we are never linear and we rage silently or not so silently at the almost straightforwardness of those who live in uh, the sheltered space of normative time. I find this to be a fascinating idea and have really started writing about it myself in terms of uh, how accessible, uh, assistive technologies um, also provide for variability in time. For example, using a screen reader, I can get through text really quickly. But um, as Karen McCall showed us the other day, when the text isn't accessible, uh, it makes it a lot slower. Uh, also yesterday, Helen spoke of uh, all of these activities trying to get a train to the, to the city of London uh, that produced variations in time, which I think is a really important aspect of accessibility that we might want to take on board when we're trying to support educational inclusion. Um, next slide. Thanks, Deb. Here's where I come back to the rights-based argument. We know that rights are frequently breached. And I think it's important that we don't get carried away with the universal universalities of rights. And thinking about this, I've gone to explore some literature that, um, that, that explores some of the um, uh, critiques of human rights in um, what we would call, um, I guess, academically, but also um, how they affect people on the ground. And um, uh, Michelino Zimbilis has done a, a fantastic review of universal rights and, and, and some of the critiques of these. And I find them really interesting for the ways that hopefully my point will come out as I get to my point in this slide. Universal human rights define a preferred universal human identity that not everyone can can really reach and 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 it and and that might be a problem for us if we're trying to include people on the basis that um, there's there's a single framework for what that might look like or even one that it's widening participation to those considered non-traditional um, and they've also uh, come up with well the second critique there is that uh, human rights tend to be written in a way that helps people to achieve an outcome that is uh, 
driven by capitalist um, in interests. Now, to go back on the uh, first few slides that I was showing with uh, Ed Roberts and, and, and Mike Oliver, Oliver, what I had described there were manifestos that are dependent on voice and experience of people with disabilities. Nothing about us without us, which is great. But these examples have been significant. These examples have been significant to the movement primarily because, in their ways, they've um, their voices of people with disabilities that have involved political action about what counts as knowledge and whose knowledge counts. But here's the here's the issue that I want to raise. At the same time, the examples are given in global North contexts by white men with physical impairments uh, who advocate for universal design uh, approaches to respond to the segregation based on their limited experiences. That is to say, in the globalised world that we live in today, there's a lot more going on. There's a lot more differentiated people with diverse intersectional abilities who come to our universities and ought to be included on the same basis. So to that end, the argument that I'm putting forward here is that uh, the tools that we've been using and the ideas that we've been drawing on have very much been uh, limited in themselves in that they are, uh, were underpinned by ideas that were not as diverse as we perhaps might have thought they were and perhaps their, their utility might be built on uh, or their utility might be made more plausible if we build on them instead of just dragging them out of the cupboard and using them uh, at face value. To the next slide. Uh, thanks, Deb. Um, I might quickly mention, you might also have noticed that there's a click every time Deb um, change a slide. Um, that's one of the, if, if perhaps you take nothing more from this presentation today, um, that's a, 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 there's a transitional tool that you can go to in PowerPoint to, to put a click or any sound you like um, in animations that helps people know what slide that you're going on to. And I find that really useful and um, I hope maybe you might as well. Um, here I am um, returning to Dan Goodley's argument that while in our discussions about inclusion of higher education, um, we might start with disability. We certainly don't end with it as we seek to transform the way we practice. And I've also suggested that neither the social model position or the, or the medical model position uh, as singular frameworks of explanation are sufficient to explain how best to support the inclusion of students with disabilities in either of the educational sectors. I'm also nervous a little bit about voice for reasons that I have kind of explained as well in that issues can uh, easily arise when we exaggerate the concept of emancipation and student agency and empowerment associated with listening to their voiced experiences. Um, we run the risk of essentializing identities by giving only those the loudest voices to be heard while others remain on the periphery. And from that end, biases can actually appear in our practices. So what is, what is my suggestion to that end? What I've been building an argument towards today is to recognize and work affirmatively with the hybridity and messiness of disability and any other a number of other intersectional circumstances as a point of, um, as a point of my of, of departure, uh, that is the interconnectedness and interdependence that underpin inclusion. That's to recognize that all of us take responsibility here and not just the individual uh, student whose autonomy we're trying to, to reach at all costs. To this end, the role of the disability, disability support uh, in taking up such an orientation is to promote such a, a position, albeit one that supports a person's uh, temporal differentiation or their, and their technological use, or perhaps the necessity or desire to work with a note taker in person, um, along with uh, any other uh, new advancements of, of, of technology that may come about us uh, for us. Uh, it, is, it is the turn to the relational and the productive potential of difference 
that allows us to go on. And I make the provocation that um, uh, in the interest of time, I invite everyone to consider what opportunities or possibilities are lost when we neglect to stop uh, or at least slow down to ask questions. That is kind of the end of much of my presentation, but I will get you to go to the next slide, Deb, and um, uh, we, we turn to shameless, uh, shameless promotion here. Um, uh, Darlene mentioned a book uh, that we managed to get published last year, and I'll just speak to it briefly. Um, it uh, is called a manifesto, um, and, and, and it comes from uh, diverse voices from people with disabilities who have attended university. Um, and, and, and that has been really important to us that it, it perhaps isn't about the traditional voices with disability, but the non-traditional voices. So underpinning our project was an understanding that genuine attempts to be inclusive in the present day must reach further to, un, to not only people with physical impairments, but also sensory, intellectual, developmental and psychosocial conditions that may manifest uh, episodically. Uh, and any number of intersectional identities that, uh, sorry, different uh, identifiers that can also impact a person's capacity for study, uh, including ethnicity, et cetera. So, from the book itself, we have um, really focused on getting uh, contributors from Global South contexts, uh, all people with disabilities, uh, students who experience mental health um, concerns, uh, the culture of the academy, leaving behind the limitations of mere just compliance with um, disability, uh, with disability policy and so forth. Um, so there's the, the book cover there, I, I hope, and Deb, on to the, the next slide, um, and, and we won't stay here long. It's published by Peter Lang, and to the, fire, uh, the next slide, uh, thanks, Deb. And uh, one thing of interest here, it was actually um, the last piece of writing that I'm aware of that Mike Oliver actually penned for, for anybody because he's written the foreword. Um, and, you know, again, making a nod here to the relevance that um, the social model has been fabulous for us uh, as people with disabilities who are seeking an education and, and employment. Um, but he's even kind of mentioned in his foreword that he understands that the world is um, changing and, and the world um, should change. And, and we need to conceptualize our way around those changes. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And I think I have uh, come in at just four minutes under, um, under time. So there might be time for for some questions or, or comments there, Darlene. Well done, thank you. I just and that it was <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> um, such a powerful way to, to end the day. Um, I just am amazed how much we can pack in to, to three hours um, and to from going from, you know, the presentation from Desi, it felt like it started this morning, but it was this afternoon. Um, to end with you, Ben, um, it's just, and everything in between has just been amazing.